In this second episode of our Patagonia series, we begin our camper van road trip from the bottom of the South American continent through Chilean and Argentine Patagonia. Here we embark on what is considered one of the best day hikes in the world. And travel through the arid Patagonian steppe where we uncover abundant wildlife coloured desert sands and one of the oldest archaeological sites in South America. An unforeseen issue leaves us wondering if we will be forced to stay overnight in the Argentine desert. With a little luck and help from some friendly locals, we were able to cross into Chile, entering one of the most scenic highways on Earth, the Carretera Austral. On Chile's largest lake, we explore by boat wondrous caves as well as natural monuments made of marble and make new friends on our journey north. Finishing up at a spectacular national park, complete with temperate rainforest, glaciers, and waterfalls. Join us on this epic road trip as we tackle one of the most remote and magnificent places on Earth. We continue from our previous episode where we explored one of the world's largest non-polar glaciers and completed one of the most renowned multi-day hikes on Earth. So we are in Punta Arenas. I am going to do the introduction for the day because Miranda has lost her voice. So we're going to walk around Chile's largest southern city. So we're going to have a little bit of a look around. It is Sunday. Unfortunately, everything is closed except for El Mercado. We're feeling a little hungry, so we're going to head there in just a second. One thing I want to show you is this statue just up here. So behind me here we have a statue of Hernando Magellan who came through here in 1520 and got lost in the strait just off the port here that now bears his name. So him and his men, they actually got stranded in the strait trying to find a way out that eventually led to the Pacific Ocean which he then called the calm and pacified ocean due to the amount of wind and crazy weather they get down here in the area. This is back in 1520, so he was the first European to arrive in this part of the world. We're gonna go check out Punta Arenas now and head down to El Mercado. So this is typical of the area, this is a calafate sour, like a pisco sour, but with the calafate berry. This is way more than I was expecting. Tell us what you got, Miranda. That's huge. Um, well, I got, uh, it's called like a chupe di centoy, which is like a king crab pasta and cheese dish, apparently um, local to the area. Yeah, I can't even remember the name of mine now because I had that pisco. Jeez, <laughs> um, it's got like everything chicken, like seafood, and some sort of soup, I'm guessing. Yeah. Cool. Buen provecho. How is it, Jiggy? So good. <laughs> A lot of crab in there. They did not chip you on the crab at all. This is full of crab. <laughs> So I'm still getting through my Caranto, which is the typical of uh, Chile, or at least the southern region of Chile. We had the mussels, uh, we've had the chicken drumsticks, smoked ham, chorizo, polenta, potatoes, and the soup to just dip it all in a spizzle. So that was El Mercado in Punta Arenas. Really good value for money. We went to a place called Suel Fun. I hope I am pronouncing that correctly. I don't even know what that means exactly, but the food there was delicious for like a two large seafood meals. It cost us about 43 US dollars, which is pretty good value for money for that. Um, I think we're gonna make a really, really nice, light and easy meal for dinner tonight. Okay, so we're finally uh, getting out of Punta Arenas. This is our beast for the next few weeks here in Patagonia. The mystery machine, Scooby-Doo and his friends, that will be us over the next few weeks. 
Uh, we're in a place called Zona Franca just as we're leaving Punta Arenas. Zona Franca is actually a tax-free area on the port of Punta Arenas. Uh, one of the problems here in Chile is the taxes are really high. They're about 19%. So this is a, a good way of saving a little bit of cash if you're leaving from Punta Arenas. And we're gonna stock up on some things for the next few days. We've just departed on our two and a half week road trip throughout Patagonia. Picked up our Wicked Camper this morning some food shopping and now we're officially on the road heading towards the Argentine border. Our goal is to get to El Chaltén by tomorrow so we're gonna go to Rio Gallegos um, for a quick stop and then maybe a campsite on the way. We'll see how we go. Um, but yeah, super exciting. Shell 10, where we plan to do the Laguna de los Tres trek. It's supposed to be a major highlight. Um, we're supposed to do it tomorrow, but unfortunately, it looks like it's going to rain tomorrow. And today's a sunny day, so we're up bright and early to try and make it in time to do that hike. Uh, yesterday, when we were on the road, we saw tons of wildlife. We saw an armadillo, we saw a fox, we saw. Zorro <laughs> is Spanish for fox, in case you didn't know. And we saw rias and also tons of bonicos. We also saw a bunch this morning as well, which is pretty cool. So we'll be looking out for that today. So in the background down there, we can see Cerro Fitzroy or Mount Fitzroy, which is where we're planning to go today. It's beautiful just standing out there. So we do have perfect weather for it. We're coming out of the Patagonian steppe right now. So it's this really dry landscape that sits at the foothills of the Andes Mountains here in Patagonia. Essentially all the weather systems come in from the west and they dump rain down on these mountains here which is why this region to the east of the mountain range, the Andes, is so dry and desolate. So we've been driving through the Patagonian steppe for the last two days and it'd be cool to get back to the mountains. Really looking forward to it. Okay, Sendero Al Fitzroy, or the Laguna de los Tres Trail. It is an absolutely amazing hike. I did this hike myself back in 2016 when I was here, and I still say to this day, this is one of, if not the best single day hike that I've ever done. Now the weather tomorrow looks quite terrible, as Miranda was saying, and we went into the National Park before and spoke to the lady there, and she said, you're starting really late. Hope you're taking headlamps. It is actually an eight hour trail, give or take. Some people take up to 10 hours. We're gonna try to do it in about six or seven so we can come back just before sunset. We have headlamps just in case either way. It's a 22 kilometer hike with about a thousand meters of elevation gain. 
here in Parque Nacional Los Glaciares, the same national park as Perito Moreno that we went to last week. So we just stopped up there at the Mirador del Fitzroy, so the Mirador, the lookout of Nat Fitzroy up there. Kind of funny because last time I came here seven years ago in 2016, all you could see from that lookout there was cloud, so I had no idea what to expect and of course back then I didn't have the chicky, which meant that I did a lot less research than I do right now and I did not actually know what it looked like. So you can imagine my surprise when I got up to the Laguna de los Tres lookout right at the very end and saw Mount Fitzroy rising up there with those beautiful turquoise lakes, which we haven't seen yet, but it was all a huge surprise. We're power walking by the way, we've <laughs> killed one third of the uh, elevation for today in less than an hour and we're almost done one third of the distance, or just over I should say, one third of the distance there. So we should get up there hopefully at this rate in the next couple of hours. So up until now, most of this hike has been fairly flat, aside from the initial ascent. We're about to do our climbing right up here to Mount Fitzroy to Laguna de las Tres. Over about two kilometers, we're looking at about a 400 meter elevation gain straight up on top there. So right up on top of those hills up there, that's where we're going pretty much now. is getting pretty steep right now. We're actually in the autumn period right now, so March, autumn in the southern hemisphere. Last time I came here was the springtime, so it's totally different just to see all these beautiful autumn colors. When I did this hike about seven years ago, there was almost nobody on this trail. It's crazy to see how popular these trails have become just that small period of time. Chicky, pretty cool. This is absolutely stunning. <laughs> so worth the effort to get up here. Yeah, it was a bit of a steep climb. Uh, probably about an hour to get up. That's what uh, the recommended amount of time is. Maybe a little more if, if you're not, uh, fitness level's not completely at the top. We have still people of all sorts of fitness levels. The reason why these lakes are turquoise blue is because of refraction, which is the way the light splits when it uh, bounces through the water. So. Essentially all that glacial silt, all the powder that's ground up by the glaciers from the mountains themselves settles on the bottom of these lakes and when the sunlight hits them, refracts off. Alright, I'm going to stop talking now because we're going up to the top of the Grand Lookout, the best lookout, where you can actually see the lakes that make up Laguna de los Tres. Woo.
There we go. Laguna de los Tres. Chicky, what do you think? It is unlike anything. It is just so sunny. So we made really good time getting up here and now we're heading back down. I'm fully confident that we're not going to be needing our headlamps. We should be getting down there well within daylight. We have made it back and it is exactly 6.32 on the dot. So we are two minutes behind. I'm actually super impressed with that. That is pretty impressive actually. So six and a half hours, including a stop up the top there for at least 45 minutes. So we technically did it in under six hours. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Cool, so we are going to go back and get some food some well-earned foods here in the, the tourist town of El Chaltet. It has definitely grown since I've been here last. I remember last time there were just a few sort of places dotted around and now it's it was absolutely booming when we're going through. So I'm sure there's plenty of selection of good restaurants here. So we're at the uh, Bourbon Smokehouse Bar, the perfect place to recover after a big hike. Have a look at these meals. This is the lamb ribs here. This is all done in the smoker. Miranda's got the nachos and what's this one here? Smashed eggplant and focaccia. Cool. And uh, it's happy hour at the moment, so it is two pints of beer for 1,400 uh, Argentinian pesos, which works out to be under like five US dollars. Absolutely amazing. for a couple of hours now we're on the uh, Ruta 40, which is the Route 40. It's one of the main highways that pretty much goes up the spine of Argentina. It's been a little bit of an interesting journey because we've sort of been out in the middle of the desert, very, very dry, very rocky, and then all of a sudden we got to a, a very, very gravelly uh, corrugated road. It reminded us of being in the outback in Australia, just going through those dry, rocky, crumbly roads, and obviously we're not in a four-wheel drive, so in this vehicle here it was quite difficult. The original plan was to cut through to a place called Bajo Car Caracoles, which I believe means under the snails, under snails, I don't know, <laughs> but um, we had a look at the turn off and finally we'd reached some paved highway and the turn off went down a gravel road and I'm like, I'm, I don't think <laughs> no we can thanks. we can do that, not in this, no. <laughs> so we're going to instead go to uh, a place called Gobernador Gregores, which is on the Ruta 40, the Route 40. We'll stop there for the night. Apparently there's a place looking at the e-overlander, i-overlander. That's an app that we'd highly recommend using if you are journeying through this region here, especially with the camping situation. And uh, apparently there's a place there that does camping and they have good Wi-Fi and showers and things like that. So we've got about another hour, hour and a half to go of driving. Hopefully on a, a paved highway for the rest yeah. of the way. We'll see. <laughs> This is us sheltering from the crazy wind outside right now. Isn't that right, Chicky? That's right. It is wild. <laughs> this wind is crazy. So this is Gina. Hi, Gina. Hello. Hello, Poppy. Miranda's been trying to get her in here. <laughs> She's not staying in our tent. Oh God, this is messy at the moment. So I probably shouldn't be showing this off right now. Out of the arid desert scape of the Patagonian steppe, we spot a herd of wild guanacos, 
relatives of the domesticated llama. Among them, we also spot a fox scavenging on the remains of an unfortunate casualty that has succumbed to the dry harshness of the desert. we notice a colorful shift in the landscape and decide to stop to investigate. So we are in Sendero Tierra de Colores in Portal Cañadón in Puras, which is basically like a reserve or a part of a national park used to protect not only these beautiful geologic, geological mountains that we have around us here, the colored mountains that we have, but also as well one of the best archaeological sites in South America, or at least one of the oldest archaeological sites in South America that goes back to almost 10,000 years. It is called the Cueva de las Manos, so the Cave of Hands. Unfortunately, it's about a four hour round trip from here, even though it's just down the road, the whole journey itself includes a hike into the canyon and a guided tour. We were actually weighing it up. It was a very hard decision to decide that we couldn't do it. We tried to figure it out, but uh, it just wouldn't fit in with our itinerary. It is right around the corner from here. It does look absolutely amazing, but we're gonna hike through this beautiful canyon and explore the canyon. here are hills made of fractures from the two tectonic plates colliding, creating the giant massive mountain range known as the Andes here. So those little fractures create these hills and these hills are exposed to all sorts of elements like wind and rain which create these sort of geological features that we have around us here. Now an interesting thing is due to the composition of the soils we have different reactions that happen with the air and the water when they're exposed. So you have all these different colors and behind us we have a whole bunch of really, really colorful hills that they call the ice cream clays. Take a detour to a station known as La Posta, where our journey then leads us down a long, questionable, unpaved road. We had a little bit of a change of plans. I was kind of 50-50 on the whole Cueva de las Manos thing, knowing that it would be pretty far out of our way if we were to do it today. However, when we were doing our hike before through the colored canyon, we bumped into two Austrians who pretty much convinced us that it was definitely worth doing. Already it is magnificent descending down here into this canyon. We decided we're gonna stay here tonight at La Posta, 
which is just at the start of the, the park area. And the lady there was nice enough to lend us 2,000 pesos so that we could pay our 2,000 per person peso entrance fee and guide here into the Cueva de las Manos. So we're going to actually check out one of the top archaeological sites here in South America. I'm really glad that we're doing this for one because I'll tell you what, I think the, the small child inside of me that grew up watching Indiana Jones would be kicking myself forever if we didn't stop here and check out one of the oldest archaeological sites in South America. So really looking forward to that. We're actually rushing right now to get down to the five o'clock session. And that means that we can actually get back before dark if we do that. We have to actually hike down to the canyon floor as we're doing at the moment. You can see I'm already out of breath. They told us it would take one hour to walk here. We ran it in 25 minutes and we just made the five o'clock session by two minutes, which means we can go on that session and then we'll be done by six o'clock. We can get out of here before dark. That's exactly what we wanted. So the first inhabitants of this area came here about 10,000 years ago following the Guanacos, pretty much from the Lake Argentina, which we're going to tomorrow. And they followed it down along the Pinturas River, which is the river down here, ended up in this valley here. The canyon walls themselves are 300 meters high and they date back about 200 million years ago to the Jurassic period. And they're made of igneous rock, which is volcanic rock. It's a very beautiful area. Remember the 2021? Mm -hmm. The rocks fell off the canyon. They fell down? Yes, it's a big rock. So the rock broke the wallway. Later you will see the, the wallway. So this section of the cave here collapsed 3,000 years ago and Augustine was just saying that there, sh there would be probably hundreds or thousands of paintings under here that would have been destroyed during that period of time. 2,000 paintings of hands we're about to see in the next section. The oldest ones date back 9,300 years ago, up until about 2,000 years ago. So the techniques used here is like a negative image. So it's basically putting the hand up against the wall and and spitting whatever the, the elements that created the paint is onto the wall, uh, creating a negative image of the hand. Out of the 2,000 odd hands here, only 30 of them are right hands, which means that they would have put up their left hands and used their right hands to gather up the paint. Different errors, uh, represented by different colors up here. So the oldest color is the orange one, which is made of ochre. Then we have black and then the red, then the white ones. He's actually going to show us a green one very shortly, which are the, the more recent ones, but they're using natural minerals. So that's all they used were the natural minerals from the rocks here, along with blood, fat or water as well. Back here you can see the cave where the nomadic peoples that use this area here would come in the winter time to shelter. Uh, they would follow the guanacos and this is where they would end up in the winter period and it created perfect shelter for them. You can see the black up there from the campfires. Over here on the right hand side you can see this cave uh, or these pictures with the full moon and also a whole bunch of pregnant uh, guanacos that date back about 6,000 years ago and that roughly is around the same time that a volcanic eruption occurred which would have decimated the population of the guanacos. So it's almost like wishful thinking that they would paint these pregnant guanacos in hopes that their fertility rates would go up higher, which apparently did so in the full moons. That's when they gave birth. That's what they believed anyway. So that's why they painted those up there. A couple of interesting things here on this one. First of all, there's a hand there with six fingers. The way they did it is they actually painted the rock first in red and then they did the, the blowing technique with white on top. One of the reasons why six fingers is because they traveled in small groups, 15 to 20 people. There were 89 separate family groups in this canyon itself, so there were other groups about. The other one is the footprints of the rear and a spirit that they have over here, which is a negative spirit, a bad spirit called the Wilicho. That's a, an archaeological name for these negative spirits. Speaking. 
Ambush. Ambush, yeah. I tramp, yes. And the line on the rook represents the kanji to corner. Ah, oh, wow, okay, cool. Yes. update we are still just at the car park from uh, the Cueva de las Manos we've run into a bit of a problem you see our van it basically has this thing where you switch on the lights and when you open up the door it doesn't make that beeping sound for the lights to go off and of course here in Argentina you need to have your lights on at all times so I completely forgot that I had left my lights on because it's not the habit from where we live in New Zealand and we've come back after our tour and the battery is completely flat. Now, luckily we've run into one of the rangers here, Nicholas, who was actually waiting for one of his friends to come pick him up. And he said, yeah, sure, we can charge your battery. Great. Well, his friend completely forgot to get him. So he's stranded as well, like us. We are waiting for some other people to potentially come, but it's starting to get dark and the, the condition of the road isn't great. So potential alternative is that we stay here for the night which in all honesty i could probably think of worse places to go camping yeah it's not too bad to be honest and uh he said worst case scenario if they have to come back in the morning they can come back in the morning so we'll see crossing into Chile today by Chile Chico but first we will stop in Los Antiguos along the way on the Argentine side to get one last lunch while we still have the blue ray on our side and then once we cross into Chile Chico we'll be driving along the beautiful Lake Buenos Aires on the Argentine side on the Chilean side they call it General Carrera Lake and it should be gravel road up until we get to Puerto Rio Tranquilo, which we plan to stay for the night and hopefully do the Marble Caves cruise if we have time. But yeah, we'll see. All right, so we're here in Los Antiguos. It's a beautiful little town down here on uh, the lake or Lago Buenos Aires. As Miranda said before, we're gonna stop here for lunch because we actually get what is called the blue rate. We were talking a little bit about this earlier when we were in Buenos Aires, about the fact that we get a really good exchange rate due to the ridiculous inflation that they have here in Argentina. So we've been taking advantage of that and using our cards, we basically get half the price of the exchange rate. We've just filled up our fuel and our spare jerry can our petrol tank as well to take across to chile because once we get across there everything is automatically at least double the price if not more that's food that's accommodation that's fuel that's everything fuels probably about three to four times the price so we're just making sure we're taking advantage of everything while we can while we're here in argentina uh, stocking up on supplies as well the only thing we may not be able to take across the border is fresh produce so We've done a little bit of shopping, but we might grab a few more things before we go. After crossing the border, we entered one of the most beautiful and treacherous drives we had ever attempted in a two-wheel drive, causing us to slide off the road at one point.
arrived into the port town of Rio Tranquilo and we are finally officially on the Carretera Austral which is known as one of the best road trips in the world. This basically goes up through the spine of Chile, up through Patagonia, all the way up to the north. We'll eventually make our way up to Santiago and we'll be traveling this road for at least the next week and a bit so it'll be quite interesting. It wasn't an easy journey to get onto this road though so after we crossed the border from Argentina into Chile through Chile Chico pretty much the paved roads disappeared. It wouldn't be a problem if we were in a four-wheel drive but we're in a beat up old two-wheel drive van, a camper van that we got through Wicked Campers. It didn't really handle the road too well, there's a lot of potholes, there's a lot of of gravel and actually it reminds me a lot of New Zealand this area if the roads were in better condition but obviously they weren't. There was one point we even slid off the road luckily into a, a very very safe area and we weren't going too fast but you could feel that at certain stages you had to slow right down to keep control of vehicles so this is my word of advice if you are coming through that Chile Chico side it is absolutely stunning getting down here to Rio Tranquilo however you have to be very very cautious and I'd highly recommend taking a four-wheel drive. Now tomorrow when we get up to Cerro Castillo we're going to get back onto the paved road so we've only got a little bit of a journey left tomorrow. But that's just a little bit of word of advice. We're going to stay here tonight because it's quite windy and we're going to do our boat ride tomorrow rather than this afternoon because it's just way too uh, windy and chaotic out there. We are free camping tonight so we are staying here at the bayfront so just on the waterfront here in Rio Tranquilo and we have bathrooms we can use across the road at the Copec fuel station. This is Havisa Rear around the corner so I'm looking forward to grabbing a beer which is like a brewery and uh, we're gonna have something to eat first and then we'll head back over there. Okay, so it's bright and early, the sun's just risen, we're about to do the Marble Caves tour, Capilla de Marmo, and we have pretty much not reserved anything, we just came down to the waterfront here and there are a whole bunch of different uh, places offering the activity, so we're going to do the simple tour for an hour and a half and check out the spectacular Marble Caves. It's the longest cave. It's 40 meters long. You can tell how the caves are funny. The entrance is pretty broad, and then they start narrowing little by little. Whoa. Always pay attention to your head, okay? The marble from Taj Mahal in India or from Carrara in Italy. That rock it's over 900 million years. So this is kind of young if, if we compare it. 350 million years.
this one is the cathedral and this is the chapel. This is the confession booth. <laughs> finished our tour with Malmo Expediciones. Mauro, our guide, he translated the whole tour in Spanish and in English and he did a great job at explaining not only the formation of the caves and the lake but also the history of the area as well. The lake itself is actually not only the largest lake by area in Chile but it's the second deepest in South America so it is 560 meters deep. It was all glacial formed during the last ice age. The glaciers would have been massive here. He also told us the name of the lake, the indigenous name, which was Chileco, and Chile actually means thunderstorms. A lot of thunderstorms. Co means a lot of water, so this was the lake of thunderstorms and a lot of water, which we definitely didn't have today. There's barely any wind at all. It's quite still, except for the ride back got a little bit bumpy, but aside from that, it was a really, really good experience. Highly recommend. first official day of the Carretera Austral. We have left Rio Tranquilo and we'll be heading up towards a, a place just south of Koiheiki called the Eckhaus Hostel. So we have a friend who has recommended this place. We're going to meet up with him and uh, apparently he's good friends with the owner there. So we're going to spend the, the evening and the, the afternoon there settling in. We're happy about something. And that is the fact that we are off the gravel roads. We have experienced some of the worst roads driving through here. Scenery-wise, absolutely amazing, but condition-wise, not so great for a two-wheel camper van. Now, there are a lot of signs everywhere along the way saying that the road is under construction, they're bringing a lot of employment to the area, so I would guess in the next few years the whole Carretera Austral Road will be paved, but for the meantime this southern part is still a gravel road, so now that we have reached uh, Via Cerro Castillo, we have paved roads the rest of the day, so we're really excited about that and uh, excited about just relaxing for the afternoon. So with us today we have Diego and we also have Rodolfo. This is what we have created for dinner tonight. This is our beautiful masterpiece here. Masterpiece. Master Chef. Master Chef. Rodolfo is the owner slash manager of Eck House Hostel here in, uh, what is the name of this town anyway? El Blanco. El Blanco. The White. The White. The White Town here. It's a beautiful little hostel by the way. You have a really nice little place here. It's about 30 kilometers distant from Coyhaique City, capital city in San Region. Tell us about uh, your company as well, Diego. Ecotourism Patagonia. That's the company. Mm -hmm. Ecotourism. <laughs> like them on Instagram. <laughs> like both of them on Instagram. All right. <laughs> Buen provecho, guys. Buen provecho. All right. It's time. The following morning, we head out with Diego to the township of Coyhaique to refuel and stock up on supplies. Hey, 
Guys, um, welcome to Coyhaique. This is uh, Aysen Patagonia region. In that moment, we are in the monument, Mate monument. It is a drink, Mate, you know, give you energy. This is a drink. It's like a tea, but it's Mate tea. In my back is a hill. It's called Makai Hill. It's about 2,600 meters sea levels. All the mountains, this is a mountain chain. It's called Divisadero. Divisadero. Okay. Today we've got a big day planned, but first we just want to say a big thank you to Rodolfo from the Egg House Hostel, located just before Kayaki. Um, we definitely recommend staying with him if you can. He's an excellent host and it was so great meeting him last night. And also a big shout out to Diego from Ecoturismo Patagonia, who's helped us plan our next few days. He was super helpful. And today we're heading to Quilat National Park, just outside of Poyoapi, where we'll be hiking to the Ventus Quieto Glacier. So that will be a lot of fun. So we've been recommended this lunch stop here by Diego at Laguna Esponjes, so the sponge lagoon in Via Manjuales. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Miranda is going to tell us what we've got for lunch. So we've got some empanadas. We've got an empanada napolitana, and I actually have no idea what's in a, your empanada. This one, I believe, is chicken and corn. I'm pretty oh, sure. Cool. Go. Cool. And for dessert, got another empanada. Because this one's filled with apple. Manzana. And we've got these like coconut macaroon things, which are also covered in <laughs> lemon, lemon pie. pie I think which we're gonna was smashed. I think we're gonna eat the lemon pie, pie with the coconut maroons. <laughs> yeah, Let's we can it. dip it in and <laughs> be good together actually. Look at that scenery. Sweet. As we climb up into the mountains, we spot our first hanging glaciers, a sign that we are not far from our destination. So we have finally arrived into Quillot National Park and it was a little bit of an adventure to get here. You see on Google Maps it said it was about four hours away from Coyhaique. And the problem is here there's a little bit of bureaucracy when it comes to some of the national parks in Chile. For example, this national park we had to actually reserve online in advance our tickets to get into the national park. <laughs> and it also closes at 2.30 p.m. But the problem is, the infrastructure on the road here, there were some issues going over one of the high passes where it turned into this gravel road that was really steep, full of potholes and corrugations. So it was a bit of a difficult road. We had to take it really easy and slow in order to take it safe. The problem is, it actually pushed our time back. We got here just in time for the gates before they close. And we're planning to do one of the big hikes in the area that goes up to the Mirador, the lookout for Ventisquiero. The park actually closes on the other side, coming out at 4.30 p.m., which only gave us two hours to do a four-hour hike. So 
Unfortunately, we've only got an hour here in the National Park, or one to two hours, I should say, here in the National Park before we're officially locked in. I'm not sure, but we're gonna check out the glacier anyway. So Colgante Ventisquiero is actually what you call a hanging glacier, a glacier that sits up on top of a high pass on top of the mountain and hangs down but doesn't quite reach the valley floor. And it reminds us a lot of the glaciers that we have in New Zealand on the west coast, our west coast glaciers like Fox Glacier, French Joseph Glacier, and even the forest that we're going through right now is very, very similar to the Westland National Park where those glaciers sit. And it makes total sense because we're actually latitude-wise on the same level as the West Coast glaciers in New Zealand, around 44 degrees latitude, 43, 44 degrees latitude south. The altitude is roughly the same height and we are on the west coast here of Patagonia. So it would only make sense that the weather systems that roll in from the west coast would form the same sort of glaciers here in this area. But the other thing we've noticed as well that's quite similar is the actual type of forest we have around here is very, very similar to the west coast of New Zealand. Things like your beech trees that we have here, the ferns and lichens, these all go back to Gondwana land when the southern continents were connected up to 100 million years ago in the Cretaceous period. I give it 10 or 20 years before this place becomes just as busy as say Torres del Paine in the future. So I think it's kind of special that we're here right now exploring these places. Even if today we didn't get a chance to reach the top of the glacier, it's still pretty amazing to be here when it's a relatively unknown place on a global scale. <laughs> this is Miranda cooking on the fire stove. This is how your great grandparents would have cooked their food or great great grandparents. This is Michael, by the way. Hello there. <laughs> Join us in our next episode as we explore the volcanoes and lakes of northern Patagonia on our journey up to the Chilean capital of Santiago. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed our content, please like and subscribe. And we'd love if you could leave us a comment letting us know what you've enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. And help us grow our channel. Become part of the Global Travel Stories family by sharing with friends, family, or anyone you think would enjoy our content. Thanks, guys. Have a good time. It's a video. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? What are we trying to do? And what are we doing? We're sitting at a cerveceria. Miranda's drinking. No, I have a my porter. This is a 6.7% porter.